I have to actually disclaim that um, choosing wisely, uh, I've been not very familiar with the initiative, but through Fidel Rubagumia from Rwanda, I, I learned about it and actually was reading some of the things and uh, I would like to commend the great work and contribution to trying to understand how uh, cancer can be managed in low middle income countries, but uh, especially in Africa, where over time. So uh, thank you for the great introduction. And um, I've, I've, I've nothing to disclose, but uh, most of this information is actually some of my personal opinion and things I feel um, strongly about. Of course, they may not be in line with uh, the initiative in general, but we appreciate that it, it is information and uh, some of the things that we need to think about uh, for in order to try to control cancer in, in Africa. Of course, as indicated in my bios, I'm strongly uh, involved in research on HPV, cerebral cancer, and I'm also soon completing my pathology training. Uh, sorry for the typo there. But uh, that being said, I will be taking you through um, that outline. And um, I'll be basically talking in general of some of the cancers that we are uh, dealing with in most of our you know, African low middle income country settings that we would like to actually adopt some of the uh, modalities for detection. So this is an issue from the paper of Choosing Wise Africa, where I uh, try to highlight that, uh, and I agree that we have low value and unnecessary actual practices that we need to get rid of for us to be able to um, combat cancer better. And uh, there's a lot of claim, in my opinion, that uh, we have limited resources, which to a greater extent is true, but when you look at it further, you realize that um, we can efficiently and effectively use the resources we have to, to, to try to uh, deal with some of these issues, especially cancer. And um, I wanted to highlight that um, the prevention and detection efforts in Africa are actually inadequate. And if we continue, I think some of you, I will give an example of the HP vaccine, that some of you may know that if we continue the way we are doing, which means business as usual, or the status quo, we may not be able to uh, control cancer in, in Africa. So that is uh, because when you look at the data, most of the cancers actually, even those that have low incidence in most of the sub, uh, sub-Saharan African countries have even higher mortality compared to uh, high income countries, which means that we, do not, we are not able to control cancer. We're not able to screen and prevent cancer. We're not able to detect cancer early when survival is actually good enough for someone to live longer. So that is uh, partly, I think, why this uh, you know, subject to a topic of early detection, uh, prevention uh, comes in. Now, we... We know that there is existing disparities in the instance of mortality of some cancers, and I'll highlight some of them. That's what I'll be talking about, that there's lack of prevention and detection. But I'll talk about some few of the cancers, some cancers that we know that are common in our setting. And I've highlighted there are five of them. Uh, of course, the, the lung cancer, I'm not going into detail, but we know that there are some, it's, it has been one of the leading cancers in terms of incidence, but we know that uh, there is some evidence that is coming up that we can actually screen for lung cancer. I will not talk about that in detail, but we know that there is a lot of CT uh, that is something that we, we can consider. But we know that there are some cancers with evidence and longstanding practices that have been shown to be having uh, effect on the incidence. And for example, pap smear over the last 50 years, it's been used in high income countries for preventing cervical cancer, screening for cervical cancer, and actually the instance has gone down significantly. But the introduction of such programs with evidence in Africa is actually very slow due to many reasons. Of course, I know that oh, the audience is at least familiar with those to a greater extent. 
And that's why we continue to see increasing, but an increasing burden of cancer in Africa. Um, now, I, what, I put up this question. I don't know whether it's relevant to the initiative, but when we talk about uh, choosing wisely, the, the practice of cancer, I went, I went through the 10 recommendations, the 10 things that practices people should not do. And most of them are related to actual treatment, oncology, you know, uh, one of them on palliative uh, care. And, uh, but could we, uh, Think, do we think that actually the audience, this is just a, a food for thought, that not following evidence-based guidelines and recommendations, that uh, could that be a, actually a low value practice that is leading us to some of the, uh, the issues we are having? I don't know, but everyone should try to think about that. And of course, it's very difficult to define which level of uh, what we call following, because we also have issues with the evidence, the guidelines, and from which data they are derived from, but at least we know that things have worked elsewhere. We can try them in our setting and be able to achieve similar results. Now, we are all familiar with this data, but uh, I want to put this out that I want to I put, uh, because I, I did some extracts from that paper, but you can see that um, uh, the, 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 this is on the Left, that is in males and the left, the female that is the the, uh, the, fem the left that's the from females, but the commonest cancers, uh, when you look at them, of course, two things highlight here. Most of the cancers are common, most of course, the, when you look at the, the highest burden seems to be in high income countries. Uh, but when you look at uh, the instance of the mortality, I think the mortality seems to be, when you compare it with the instance, seems to be more in the low income countries. That's one, for both males and females. But look at this, for example, for breast cancer. The incidence is highest in the, is higher, sorry, in the high income, in high income countries, but the mortality actually is higher in the low income countries, regardless of the lower mortality, the lower incidence, sorry. So I wanted to highlight that and due to lack of, I mean, cancer is actually presenting late, which we have been arguing different platforms that, is it that cancer uh, patients are presenting late or it is actually late diagnosis? So those are two different things. In my opinion, and most of you would agree that our patients present early at different levels of our healthcare system, but they end up not being detected early. And then we end up with a late diagnosis with poor outcomes. Now, that is, um, uh, this is another, you know, to show the burden in terms of, for, this is for breast cancer and for cervix, which are actually among the commonest cancers, both males and females combined in most of Sub-Saharan Africa. But, the burden, for example, cervical cancer is uh, still highest in Sub-Saharan Africa. In Africa, generally, we look at this data, and this is clearly because of screening in, in, in high-income countries, period. And um, I wanted now to go through some of the few cancers I mentioned that I will go through, maybe four of them. Um, These some of the things are things that we can easily apply, and I think we were in one of the uh, sub-regional African countries for IOTIC. Uh, I think it was in June uh, in, in, in Senegal, and we're arguing that, uh, for example, the HPV vaccine has proven to prevent cervical cancer, but when you look at the coverage uh, in Africa, it is still low. Of course, some high income countries are doing very well as well, but they have other mechanisms in place and resources, but this is something we should look at. HPV testing and uh, put up cytology, self collection, sorry for HPV testing. And I put cytology and VI in, in, in red because we know for a very long time that cytology has been used in high income countries and VI in low income countries. VI is visual inspection with acetic acid with a claim that cytology is too hard to do or to implement in Africa because it requires a lot of resources. Now, 
that is maybe part of two. And then they give us a low performance test, which is VIA, which is claimed to be cheaper, but when you look at it in detail, it's not actually cheap. And then we use it in Africa because that's what we can afford. Now, that's whether that is true or not, but even the VIA, we have not been practicing it, uh, putting into practice. But we know that the current WHO recommendation facts, recommendations, actually not recommendations as, uh, as such in general, but these are targets uh, for the elimination of cervical cancer, indicate that we should be using, screen, we should be doing screening for, with using a high performance test. And they recommend HPV testing. But the adoption of that recommendation from the WHO and even putting it in practice is very slow. And uh, we have other things which I'll, I'll talk about maybe a, a little bit next few slides. The same applies for breast cancer. We have a well known, you know, the triple test we all know that works really well. Self, self, self uh, examination by the, 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 the the individual themselves to the provider, then you do mammography regularly, and then you can do a FNAC, which is a needle biopsy or a core needle biopsy, and then you have a diagnosis early when you can actually treat the, the patient and cure the cancer. Cone cancer, we know there's FOBT, spherical occult blood test that we can use to screen for cone colorectal cancer. Prostate, we have BRE, we have uh, management of early prostate cancer, which maybe the oncologists know, but um, from a clinical point of view, the are can actually work. And of course, I talked about the low city which for lung cancer, which I'll not go to the details. But when we look at cervical cancer, for example, there's current evidence that a single dose of HPV vaccine would work well. Now, we know that the, due to resources, uh, loss to follow up, the two, three dose initially, the two dose, has not been working well and the coverage has been low. Some countries, I mean, like maybe for Rwanda, we know that we have a very high coverage over 90% over the last 10 years or so. But the current single dose vaccine, the adoption, or adoption of that policy, for example, would take very long time in low income countries because, you know, to digest the evidence, the policy, and then to change the, and then to, allocate resources, maybe we shall wait for donors until we have that in place. So that is a very uh, uh, you know, difficult situation to manage because there is uh, evidence from models that shows that when you delay to implement, for example, a single dose vaccine for two, three, five years, and you predict the incidence of cervical cancer in 2100, which is 2100, yeah, that's yeah, like around you know, 80 years or 78 years from now, you realize that you'll be the instance of cyber cancer will actually increasing as you delay to implement this recommendation. We have some other issues that like local generated evidence about the vaccine, for example. We we know that there is a nine nanovariant vaccine for HPV that is available. But we keep having the four valent vaccine, which covers two, uh, the HPV 16 and 18, two of the, of course, most common and associated, most common associated HPV types of cervical cancer. But why can't we easily implement the nine nanovariant vaccine and have it? Of course, we shall wait for Gavi, funders, and so on and so forth. Effectiveness of vaccine, have we studied our populations? We have, you know, that there's high burden of. Uh, cervical cancer among women with HIV compared to women without HIV. But are there studies that have shown that we can have actually that done? I don't know, but that is something you need to look into. Now, um, screening, of course, uh, and some other detection of, and treatment of cancer lesions. I would claim resources from um, the clinical point of view, resources from allocating prevention, uh, uh, you know, strategies and implementing them, but we need to do more in terms of uh, detection and treatment, as otherwise you'll keep uh, having patients presenting late, uh, uh, being diagnosed late, uh, you know, late stage cancers and then having poor outcomes. I'm sorry, I wanted to add a paper here for, from a study that is being done in Kenya, 
about the single vaccine, but I had this study we are doing in Rwanda to try to compare the effectiveness of the vaccine for women with HIV compared to uh, women without HIV. And actually the data is a bit, uh, you know, striking that uh, the preliminary data, we are seeing that actually the vaccine may not be working well in women with HIV compared to women without HIV. So that is because um, there is a lot of immunodistribution and some other factors that we need to look into further. And we are actually thinking about recommending a booster dose for, for, for women with HIV to be able to give them enough protection against HPV infection. Now, breast cancer. We know that uh, there is evidence that breast stratification in terms of uh, uh, whether you use genetic testing, whether you use uh, age, you know that we have breast cancer that are, you know, appearing early compared to maybe other countries, you know, early young women. So screening can be based on that, this stratification rather than just, just, you know, adapting some of those recommendations from high income countries that might be working well in our settings. Of course, I talked about the, the, the triple test, but I wanted to further mention that when should we begin, for example, mammography in African populations? Is there data, data that shows that maybe we should begin, if the recommendation is 35, 40 years in general, maybe we should begin at 30. So this requires that, and I will maybe uh, as, uh, towards the end talk about that. Policy on access as, uh, of, of services. I mean, how do people access services and at what level? Um, should we access services for our populations? That is because, for example, I'll give an example of Rwanda. They, when you look at the structure of the, the pyramidal structure of the healthcare system, when you begin at the low, lowest level, which is the community, to the health post, the health center, the capacity and the knowledge of all those cadres, healthcare cadres at those levels, is not sufficient to actually detect cancer early. That's why people come, come in, have something wrong, they take them back, give them painkillers until you realize that it's too late to refer them for a diagnosis of late stage cancer. But I wanted to mention the paradox in policy. We have settings in Africa, for example, where the health insurances cover accepting for the treatment of heart to enriched cancers, breast cancers, but actually they don't cover the, 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 the heart to immunosochemistry, which gives us you know, the diagnosis to be able to say that this is someone who is HER2 positive and they will be able to benefit from targeted therapy by, with, with accepting. So how can you, you know, explain that there is this kind of paradox in policy, that the health insurance can cover the treatment but can't cover the diagnosis. So that is something we need to, to look at. Molecular testing, of course, we know most of the cancers currently, WHO classification of cancer is based on molecular you know, aspects of cancer. Now, we claim that molecular testing is not amenable in our setting for many reasons, resources, and, and so on and so forth. But there are some other things that we can adopt, including, including surrogate markers, in you know, chemistry that can be able to, we can be able to implement easily and use as we wait for the sophisticated uh, molecular testing, including, you know, fish, PCR, NGS, and so on and so forth. Now, I didn't, I won't go into the details of this, but most of the, Risk factors for breast cancer, for example, are things that can be able to, we can go through and try to implement and, for example, age, screening females, personal history, and uh, familial history of, of breast cancer, and so on and so forth. Those are things that we can easily look into and implement that don't require a lot of resources, but wait for, you know, it to be, but for example, something like family history, we all know, I'll talk about this further, that when you look at uh, uh, the, the, what our patients actually, which, what knowledge they have, how we've been educating them. We know that in Africa, someone will be having a, I've been seeing patients in the FNA clinic here, yes, and you ask them, do you, the, the form says someone has a history of cancer, they have a diagnosis, that, do you know you have cancer? Patient says, I don't know. Oh, you really don't know? Yes, what did the doctor tell you? I have results, but I don't know what they are. I, I don't know whether it's cancer. They told me they've been treating me. I had a biopsy. I have a, they don't even know what diagnosis they have. So that is very bad. Now, 
That means that if the patient themselves don't know, will the relatives know? That's when we ask someone, do you have a family history of breast cancer? They, they will not know because even the patient who died of breast cancer, they don't maybe know that they died of breast cancer. That is something that is very discouraging. But um, I wanted to just highlight here that uh, breast cancer, for example, which is the common cancer in most of our sub-Saharan Africa, first or second, has overtaken generally lung cancer from the 2018 data to the 2020 data. And we should, uh, when looking at the details, we should actually further detect breast cancer early and improve the outcome. It is very bad, very, very bad. Someone comes in with a diagnosis of breast cancer, they have been sitting around without treatment for months, then they come up with a, an axial mass, which turns to be metastasis. So if you had treated that six months ago, it would be actually a better outcome. Colorectal cancer, this is something I wanted to put highlight, but of course the same story about having a, not having a family history, patients presenting early and screening for um, uh, uh, um, uh, sorry, we have actually molecular testing that can show, in so chemistry even molecular testing that can show that most of our cancers that present colorectal cancer, that present less than 50 years, those patients and their family members should be screened because of uh, microsatellite instability, mismatch repair that can actually be targeted. And actually there is uh, evidence that uh, we can have a vaccine for this. So this is very important for us to be able to do risk specification for prevention and then use the available tools like fecal ocular blood testing. I talked about that, that's a cheap test that you can use. Uh, colonoscopy services, the same story with uh, cerebral cancer where you say, oh, how many gynecologists in a certain country in Africa can actually are doing coposcopy? And we all know the burden of cerebral cancer in our countries. I've oh, been doing coposcopy for years. Maybe I did some in my training. I've, I did training coposcopy. Those are gynecologists. So it's very sad that we need to actually be doing some of this. Um, I wanted to talk about just as I close some some of these things. For example, on Facebook, we I know a story of someone, actually a relative, who, due to beliefs, refused a DRE. That's a digital exam to be screened for, for prostate cancer. And they said that I can't have it. No one can, you know, insert their finger into my anus, and I better die. But it makes you wonder, is the community educated? Is the patient actually educated enough to be able to make informed decisions that you just need to have this simple test, physical actuary exam, and then you can try to take a biopsy and see whether you can uh, get your, early, your, your cancer early, maybe treat it. But integration of services for physicians looking at uh, um, cancers as one of the, the differential diagnoses. Someone will know, oh, infectious diseases, we have to treat about some other th serious things, but internal medicine specialists, do they actually think about cancer as a serious part of things they, they, they're able to manage? Or they wait for, oh, surgeon will look at them, the, 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 the oncologists and so on and so forth. This also leads to fragmented service delivery and some of the other issues that we have, not working in a multidisciplinary team. Uh, and, and some others. So, for example, also prostate cancer management. This is maybe twice managed, but early prostate cancer can be just managed by surveillance because we know that the treatment, including prostate cancer, actually have, uh, brings about a poor quality of life. But we see a lot of prostates being taken out. We see a lot of uterus which are being taken out because we think that the patient will never be seen again, so they'll be lost to follow up. We need to treat them aggressively. Mm -hmm. and those who know you say frappe fall. We need to just treat them aggressively, we only see them again. So when I get the patient, I will have to get hold of them. If they have something else going on in the uterus, I just take out the uterus and things like that. But those are not good practices and we should stop doing those things. And we encourage our patients regardless of all the structure, social, economic, you know, uh, issues that they're having that lead them to be lost to fall up, that we should try to encourage them to follow through the, 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 the care, but actually provide a standard of care because Africans don't do this other place. Now, the, of course, as a pathologist, soon uh, completing my training in pathology, 
I feel that there's a lot of issues around pathogen Africa. There have been a lot of efforts to try to address this, but it's not true, in my opinion, that we cannot address some of these issues, that we cannot provide cytology, cytology, cytopathology services, for example, that we cannot improve our turnaround time for our biopsies, that we cannot do immunosochemistry, molecular pathology, digital pathology, AI, that if you claim that cytology is too hard, why can't we invest in you know, machine learning where all the studies in cytology can actually be automatically read by machine and so on and so forth. But the role of pathologists in research, we know that most of the clinicians are the ones that are involved in research. They say, oh, pathologists will be involved not in the scientific work, but yes, they will be reading our slides. That lack of involvement with pathologists is actually, you know, I think contributing to the lack of uh, uh, eye detection and so on and so forth. And this also is coupled with the lack of communication and collaboration between clinicians and uh, pathologists. They don't talk to each other. The pathologist is a, 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 a diagnosis which is, should be brought to the attention of the, the clinician. They just put in the system and they wait for the clinicians to, the clinicians see it and say, ah, this pathologist may not have made the right diagnosis. I will send it to another pathologist, to another private lab and so on and so forth. Or they cut the specimen into two. One is sent to a public lab, another one to a, 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 private, a private lab. And now the diagnoses are different because the tissue is not the same. Even micro, some micros, you know, meters of the tissue in the same slide cannot be the same having different diagnoses. So that is very important to understand from the clinician's point of view and they communicate and collaborate further. Research and innovation, as my lights uh, highlight here, is something we need to invest into. We need local derived data. We need to invest in research capacity. We need to invest in research from national budgets. When you look at the funding that comes, for example, from the NIH into Africa, do you think that that amount of money cannot be brought into our national budgets, really, and fund our research? I don't know, but that's a uh, food for thought as well. Dissemination of findings. Can we find better ways for the findings and our research to be, you know, showcased in not only the global but actually at the national level? What is the consumption of evidence by policymakers and providers? What is the level of knowledge, for example, for nurses about cancer? I, the, 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 the index of suspicion that this might be cancer. Have we trained our nurses? Are they involved in research? Do they know which, what is the current evidence and standards and so on and so forth? Uh, of, of course, that is the lowest level. I'm not, I'm not going to the doctors who are also have deficiencies, but that shows you that we need uh, a lot of things to do. New, new technologies, I talked about AI, automatic visual variation, for example, the sub, of, for cervical cancers to replace VIA, for cervical cancer to replace VIA, and, uh, and so on and so forth. But in, in, in summary, I would like to, um, you know, better talk to the evidence, uh, to the audience if I would, but we still have a lot of work to do as we are trying to manage the late stage cancers, palliative care, treatment, or sophisticated chemotherapy, radiotherapy. Let's take a step back and look at, uh, you know, cervical cancer prevention and eye detection. And with that, I thank you so much for our attention. Mm -hmm.